from the book of Romans, starting at chapter 4. What then shall we say about Abraham, our forefather according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not reckoned as a gift, but as his due. And one who does not work, but trust him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is reckoned as righteousness. And then starting at verse 13. The promise to Abraham and his descendants that they should inherit the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. And if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all the descendants not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. I want to talk about faith this morning. You know, Faith is, is so many things to so many different people and is used in extraordinary and in small ways. You know, I'm, I was thinking about the, the fire furnace and the three Hebrew children. And uh, this summer the, at church camps all over America, they'll sing that old familiar song uh, about, about the children, Abraham's children, and uh, the, the three, three Hebrew children. I can't remember the song now. But anyway, so the king has everybody worshiping a great idol made of himself. And when the music plays, everybody's supposed to fall down. And Meshach, Shadrach, and Bendigo, they don't. So the king says to them, bow down and the next go around with music and all will be well. They don't do it. So he says, has them brought in and says, who can save you from my hand? Anybody who doesn't do it is supposed to be thrown into the fire or furnace. So one of them says, O king, he said, the Lord who we serve is able to deliver us from your hand and from the fiery furnace. Then he says these famous words, but if not... <laughs> Know this, we will not, you know, bow down to idols. And, of course, you, you know the story. They, they're thrown into the fiery furnace. They don't burn up. Their clothes don't even smell of smoke. And they are delivered from the fiery furnace. It's great. It is a great story of faith. But I, I do like when the guy says, but if not, <laughs> you know, or like, well, we have to wait on God on these things. We don't know how this is going to turn out. Yeah, sometimes when you use faith, you're like that. I don't know how it's going to turn out, but I'm going to stand here and hold my ground and hope, hope that things turn out okay. I really like uh, country music songs, and uh, Alan Jackson wrote a song uh, not too many years ago, and it's called Living on Love. And you probably catch it on the radio every now and then. It has a catchy tune, and it goes like this. Two young people without a thing say some vows, and they spread their wings. Settle down with just what they need, live it on love. By the way, my mom told me you just can't live on love. Anyway, she doesn't care about what's in style. She just likes the way he smiles. It takes more than marble and tile, live it on love. And then it gets to the course. Live it on love, buying on time. Without somebody, nothing ain't worth a dime. Just like an old-fashioned storybook rhyme, live it on love. It sounds simple, that's what you're thinking. But love can walk through fire without blinking. It doesn't take much 
when you get enough living on love. And then it goes to the end of life. Two old people without a thing, children gone, but still they sing. Side by side on that front porch swing, living on love. He can't see anymore, and she can barely sweep the floor. Hand in hand, they'll walk through that door, just living on love in the last chorus. Living on love, buying on time. Without somebody, nothing ain't worth a dime. Just like an old story, uh, book, rhyme, living on love. It sounds simple, that's what you're thinking. But love can walk through fire without blinking. It doesn't take much when you get enough living on love. Yeah, having the faith that things will work out. On this Sunday of Lent, I want to talk about faith. And I know that Alan Jackson's song, Living on Love, is, is about love. It's about faith. But sometimes it uses the word interchangeably, love and faith. And I really like that line, love can walk through fire without blinking. And I know that faith can also do that in a person's life. This morning's Bible readings are all about faith in a person's life. 121st Psalm talks about how God watches over us. I will lift up my eyes under the hills. From whence does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. And the psalmist is making a differentiation between what he and his people believe and what the other people of the lands believe. You know, they believe that they're gods, the gods of the hills, you know, and they worship them and they have the high places up on the hills. And he says, no, my faith is in the Lord who made all these things, the God of the heavens and of the earth. You know, not in these idols. That's where his help comes from. At that time, when they're living, they see the other nations doing better. They're wealthier, they're greater, have greater armies that, you know, they're looking to these hills, and he says, don't do that. You know, that's just surface stuff. The psalmist's faith in God is greater, and his faith is that God is the one who does the great things, that he watches over you, keeps you from harm, over all your coming and your going now and forevermore. This is his faith, his faith in the God who made the heavens and the earth. You know, having faith that God protects us, watches over us, keeps us from harm, is something that we learn. That's maybe why we have Sunday school and all those kinds of things. Faith is more often, they say, caught than taught, though. You teach it to your children by having faith in your everyday life while you're around them. It's by what you do and, of course, what you don't do how you worry, how you don't worry, how you move forward, how you don't move forward. It's how you talk, what you were afraid of, how you let faith, you know, draw you through the tough things of life. You know, becoming a grandparent is a great thing. And uh, if any of you who are parents right now and have children, let me tell you something. Being a grandparent is where it's at. If, if, if you could start, hey, Take it easy down there. Just take it easy. Stay in your lane. <laughs> you know, if you could start out being a grandparent, it'd be a great thing. It's, it's a whole lot of fun. And, uh, but you get a chance to teach faith. Speaking words of faith. Doing things of faith. And those little kids, they will follow you. This may be the greatest gift that grandparents can give. That a child grows strong in the faith. Do you ever catch yourself not having faith? When you question, does the Lord really care about what's going on with me? Will the Lord really provide? Will the Lord really keep me safe? You know, am I just going to wither and die here? You know, people pick up on this, especially children. It took a lot of faith for Jesus to keep going to the cross. And, you know, in this Lenten season, we think of Jesus on his way to the cross. The pressures of the world were upon him. Some people wanted to make him king by force. You know, they could see the greatness. They could see the power. They could see the glory. 
But they, could, they oftentimes would say, you're on the wrong road. You know, you're going the wrong way. You need, you need to have some power. You need to raise an army and all kinds of stuff. He, he rejected all these things. And not only that, his disciples wanted him to become king. Man, they really put the pressure on him. And his own family also. And you'll find many places where his family tried to dissuade him from, uh, you know, what he was doing. You know, you're on the wrong road. You need to be doing this, not that. And he was like, oh, my goodness gracious. You know, my enemies I can handle, but deliver me from my friends and family, you know. Maybe you've been on the same place, and, and he's got all these pressures upon him. And he knows he's going to the cross, and his family, I imagine they knew it too, and they didn't want him to go to the cross, not because uh, of him or him dying. To be crucified was to bring utter shame upon your family. And at that time, they tell me that it was a shame-pride culture, not truth or lies, okay, like, like that, but it was shame and pride. And he was going to bring great shame on his family. That's why his brothers and sisters, they're not there. The only one there at the cross is one of his disciples, John, and his mom. They're there. And some of his, his friends are there, too. Well, so he has faith. Faith that the Lord will carry him. God Almighty. You know, one of the people who, are, who is lifted up in the Bible as a person of great faith is Abraham. And his story begins in chapter 12 of the book of Genesis. We read a little bit of it this morning. And his story is about 13 chapters long. He gets a lot of ink in the Bible. And Abraham was a man who was filled with faults. He was worried. He would be killed, all this kind of stuff, and all kind of craziness happened. He didn't always look to God first. But he did learn as he walked along with God to have faith. To learn to have faith in a God who would lead him so far from home to a new place, across a wilderness. He learned the awesome ways God could provide. Faith, if anything, is that journeying and that learning. And that was Abraham. He was learning as he kept on on the journey. And I think maybe the greatest part of it is that we are all on a journey, whether we're young or we're old. Maybe as we get older, I think it's even harder to have, have faith, to hang in there on certain things. You don't necessarily have to be traveling to a new land to be on that journey. You could be on that journey that is a great journey and never leave Caddis. Although I do hope you leave Caddis sometimes. A lot of us are afraid of the journey, what God might do, where he might take us. And I'm here to say, don't be afraid of the journey. It is always the greatest thing for our lives to be on that journey with God. This week, I ask you to read the story of Abraham with new eyes. Take a trip back to Genesis and read it. Take time to let the Spirit of God speak to you about the journey of faith in your own life. You might want to also read about Jesus going to the cross in Luke. Uh, they call it the travel document as he travels on his way to, to the cross. You know, be open to the Lord and to the Spirit and his leading. I, I guarantee it'll change your life. Be open to being transformed by the power of God as you have faith in him. One of the great things that Paul talks about is faith. Chapter 4 of the book of Romans, he says that Abraham was justified before God by faith, not by any of the works that he did. At that time in the world, people thought that you had to do something or perform some great act for God to accept you. In the Jewish synagogue, they believed that because you were born Jewish, that that was enough. Paul said, hey, it ain't enough. You become right before God by having faith in him, by giving yourself to God.
In his letter to the Church of Ephesians, Paul tackles this age-old problem, how to be right for God, how to be accepted by God, how we come into his kingdom. Today, it is a big issue uh, in the religious life of the country. You know, what do we have to do? A lot of people think, hey, I believe in the Lord, that's enough. I believe that God is. Well, Paul said that's not enough. Paul says, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And it's not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works, so that anyone could boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You have a lot to do yet. God prepared it for you a long time ago. Grace is that free gift of salvation by Jesus coming to the cross on that uh, Good Friday. Faith is a part of what we bring. Sometimes, you know, having faith is harder than we'd like it to be. It's hard to have faith if life's been bitter, life's been hard, when it's been a struggle, when things don't go well, when there has been suffering and pain and loneliness. The writer of the book of Hebrew gives a great definition of faith. Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Just like the three Hebrew children found that faith is simple but really hard, Alan Jackson said, you can walk with fire, through fire, without blink. Let us pray. Well, Father, we give you thanks that you call us to faith, that we can walk through the fires, whatever they may be, Whatever may happen, we know that you're there with us, holding our hand. Be now with us, O oh Lord, that we may give thanks to you in all that we do. And all God's children said, Amen.